So let's jump right into it. Let's look at science. So if you go back a couple of millennia, um, science was done by philosopher kings who did everything, right? If you go back to Aristotle, they did physics, they did metaphysics, they did ethics, they did politics. And then if you go back to, um, we're here in Italy, right? If you go back to um, the time of Galileo, then there were just scientists. So people like Galileo were instrumentalists. They made their own telescopes, at least he did. He theorized, he did experiments, he did the observations, he did all parts of science, in this case astronomy. But for most of our, us old people's lives, science has been divided into um, experimentalists and theorists. And if you're an astronomer, the experimental side is done by observations. But either way, there's this dichotomy between experiment and observations. Now, very recently, and very recently means in my lifetime, this is split again. So there are now three kinds of science. There's experimentalists and there's theorists, and there's a new brand of scientists called numericists or computational um, scientists. And this has evolved quite rapidly, because if you go back to the 80s when I started the grad school, people made fun of the numericists saying, garbage in, garbage out, you know, this is all like kind of questionable stuff. And then you dial forward 20 years and you read papers that say, well, Fred calculated this thing analytically, but we don't believe it until our numerical simulation says that it actually happens in the computer. Um, but then even more recently, there's been this explosion of what's called data science. So now there's now four kinds of scientists. We have theorists and computationalists and experimentalists and now data sciences. So my point is, and I actually do have one, the point is that if you look at the history of science, you have philosophy and science and physics and it splits and then it splits again and then it splits again. But let's look at the time scales. For a thousand years we had kind of science and for about a century we had this nice dichotomy that us old people usually think of between experimentalists and theorists. And then it's only been a decade or two when we had sort of three branches, and more recently we have four branches. So if you kind of look at the acceleration of this from a thousand years to a century to a decade to a couple of years, there will be a branching. So the first point of this talk is that there will be a new paradigm. And this new paradigm will arrive sooner rather than later. Now this, of course, I'm guessing I'm preaching to the choir and that that's one of the whole points of FQX is to sort of identify these new paradigms and move forward, but this just kind of puts this in a, um, a, a context and it also underlines the importance of computation. So if you look at both computation and this new data of data science, it's often codified in terms of these variables. They talk about the volume of computing, the velocity of computing, the variety of computing, and if you want to go further, they sometimes talk about the veracity and the value of what they compute. So there are like all these different aspects to computing. So let's look at those very briefly. You're familiar with this one. We look at the growth of transistors versus time. I'm going to show you here a series of um, time versus year, where the vertical axis is logarithmic and time is linear, so these are exponential growth. You're all familiar with this, it's called Moore's Law. And significantly, the doubling time is about two years, okay? Hold that number in your head. Now let's look at the speed. This is sort of like the volume of computing. The speed of computing is the number of flops per second, which is now measured in, um, I don't even know, the ter from teraflops on up. <laughs> And you see that there's a nice exponential growth here. One interesting thing is that if you look at the end here, there seems to be just a little bit of a departure from the pure exponential growth law. But nonetheless, at least over the time of which we've been measuring, the speed of computing has been increasing exponentially quite nicely. Now, if you look at the volume, not the volume of computations, but the volume of data storage, you also see an exponential growth law. Here are there two shown, one's for the actual supply and one's for the demand. So what we see is that for three different measures of computing resources, we see exponential growth, and the time scale, the doubling time scale of all these, there's a couple of years. Now, what else is there in the world that has exponential growth? Well, one thing that you're familiar with is something called the stock market. The stock market um, is also growing exponential. If you look at the last century, it grows with a doubling time of seven to 10 years, depending on what you do about inflation. Now, as um, NPR likes to say, the stock market is not the economy, and the economy is not the stock market. But at the same time, if you look at GDP, it follows the same exponential law as the stock market with about the same 
doubling time, okay? Now, if you look into the future and you look at astronomical data, you see that the variety is growing. In fact, there's all these new telescope projects. Um, SDS is old, Gaia is ongoing, PanSTARRS is coming, LSS, or is ongoing rather, this is coming. And you see the volume and the velocity of data coming in and the different varieties, all of these are growing exponentially. If you look at another measure, we can look at cosmological n-body simulations. So this is the number, my axes got cut off, but this is the number of bodies versus year. So the one um, sort of milestone happens right about here, where we first were able to do n-body simulations with a million particles. That was a big deal in the early 90s. Now you can do a million particles on your phone. And the doubling time for this um, growth of n-body simulations, or the number of particles you can do, it doubles every five-thirds of a year. So it's growing even faster than the computational resources, and that's due to the increase in algorithmic um, efficiency. So just to show you what you can do, this is the uh, current state-of-the-art n-body simulation called the Olestra si simulation, and you can see um, detail that would have been sort of a pipe dream even 10 years ago and certainly 20 years ago. So the point here is that the volume of computation is growing exponentially. The velocity of, at which we can do computation is growing exponentially. The variety of things that we can see are growing exponentially. And just for completeness, we note that um, the economy is also growing exponentially, but significantly the rate of computation is currently outpacing the economy. Okay? So then, the whole point of this talk, which is very simple, is that given that we have the volume, the velocity, and the variety of all these computational aspects, given that they're all growing exponentially, are there any limits, okay? So, first a disclaimer, what we're gonna do next is an extrapolation, and extrapolations can often lead you quite far astray, okay? So, you are well aware of that, so let me just then ignore this and proceed to do some extrapolation, okay? So let's look at storage first. And I'm gonna actually give you some numbers. So Paul um, kind of used the biosphere as a benchmark. So let's just use the biosphere. The biosphere has a mass of about a trillion tons, okay? The amount of data you can store on a hard drive is about a terabyte per kilogram. So if the data storage is to grow at the current rate, there will be a time when the data storage mass exceeds the mass of the biosphere. Now that makes sense, what, and you're probably not surprised to hear this, but what you might be surprised to hear is that that happens in 32 years. Okay, so 32 years is not that long from now. So if everything were to grow at the, continu at the current rate, it's only 32 years before the whole mass that we need in data storage will exceed the mass of the biosphere. Now, to be clear, there's nothing magic about the mass of the biosphere. We could imagine having enough silicon and whatnot to have twice the mass of the biosphere, but it's just a convenient benchmark for which, for which we can make comparison. If you want to go the other limit, you can imagine that the biosphere has a um, 10 to the 42 particles in it, and you might say, well, I can at most um, use one particle per bit so I need, I can get, if I use the whole biosphere as a storage facility, I can store something like 10 to the 41 bytes, and we would exceed that in about um, 126 years, okay? So hold that thought. Now let's look at the power it takes to power all of these transistors, okay? So there's a limit, ah, the one equation I had does not work. So this says that the energy required per bit is log two times kT, where T is the temperature. That's the thermodynamic limit on the amount of energy it takes to flip a bit, okay? So the total Earth budget that we get from the sun is 10 to the 17 watts, 100 quadrillion watts. So that means there's actually a maximum theoretical computational rate that you can use if you use every bit of energy that comes from the sun into Earth and that is three times 10 to the 37 bits per second. Now, if you look at the current worldwide computational rate, it's only 10 to the 25 bits per second. So in 43 doubling times, the computational power that we need will exceed the total amount of power that is coming into the Earth, and that happens in 86 
years. And that's at the maximum efficiency of computation, the thermodynamic limit. Now, you could go to colder reservoirs, but then you have to pay for the refrigerator, and Paul will pay the power bill, I guess. Um, another way we can look at extrapolation is look at n-body systems. Since I'm going to run low on time, I'm going to speed up just a little bit. The current n-body um, capability is about um, 10 to the 12 particles. The biosphere has about 10 to the 42 particles. So if we double every five-thirds years, that's a factor of 10 to the 10 every 50 years. So in 150 years, if n-body simulations were to continue growing at the present rate, we would have more n-body simulations than we have particles in the biosphere, okay? So the whole point of this is this. We have this exponential growth. And this exponential growth is just not going to continue forever. Now, you guys sort of know this, but what's, um, and the timescales are certainly uncertain, but what's interesting is that all of these timescales, however you do the extrapolation, are order of magnitude 100 years. So in 100 years' time, the paradigm of how we do computation has to change on this planet, one way or another, okay? We'll need new energy sources, new storage strategies, new algorithms, new something. But we cannot continue Moore's law arbitrarily far in the future. In fact, we cannot continue Moore's law even very far into the future on sort of a civilization kind of time scale. Now, a few more caveats before I run out of time. One is that in the 60s, people made similar warnings about the world population because it was growing exponentially. And of course, it has seemingly stopped growing as exponentially, at least the exponential rate has slowed down. So that's an interesting aspect of this. There will be a similar saturation of the growth of all of these computational resources that we're talking about. Another related issue is the so-called artificial intelligence singularity. The idea here is that as computational capabilities grow, there will be a point in time when AI is smarter than humanity, and then people worry in a science fiction scenario and even in real scenarios that computers will take over the world. But, and it could happen, but we have a bit of a race, right? The question is, does the exponential growth in computation saturate before or after we reach the singularity? I don't know the answer to that, but that's good food for further thought over beer tonight, perhaps. Um, but just to place where we are in history now, Right now, we have this AlphaGo, which can beat the world's best Go player. And that requires this many watts, 3,000 and some watts. That exceeds our wattage by a factor of 34. And that exceeds the amount of power that the average American uses by about a factor of two. So where we are in this whole artificial intelligence business today in terms of power usage is that we would need to triple our power usage in order for computers to beat everybody at Go. Now, that doesn't actually mean they would take over the world. That just means they would take over the Go <laughs> tournaments. Um, so they would have to go further in order to take over the world, but that's just where we are. So there is a solution to this. Um, if you really did have an AI that was dangerous, I would sort of humbly suggest that you don't connect it to the internet. Um, so to summarize, <laughs> computational resources are finite. Um, we see that over the course of history, there are more and more paradigms from just science to science and experiment and so on. So there will be a new paradigm. There will be a revolution. But because of these constraints, the revolution is going to be delayed. The revolution will have limits computationally. And there's many challenges for the future. So the challenges include we have to overcome the energy limits. We have to overcome storage limits. And we have to adapt to the constraints that we can't keep growing exponentially forever. And we have to somehow, if you can, this is where the real money maker is, is to anticipate the next um, big paradigm shift. Right now, the economy depends on increased computational resources. So if you can forecast when this saturation will occur, then you can make a lot of money on the stock market. So there's lots of solutions that one could put in place. Um, you can look at new power sources, better algorithms, um, more efficient storage, and even going back to the dinosaur age, more analytic development. But let me close down with um, a thought. And this thought is a little bit on the wildly speculative side, but I think of all conferences in the world, this is probably the place to present this particular idea. So you've heard of cloud computing. 
Let us go to the concept of black cloud computing. So the idea here is actually similar to one of Dyson Spheres, and this is something I've been talking about with Greg Laughlin, although we haven't got around to publishing anything on this yet. So if we run out of computational resources on the planet, and in some sense, the most, one of the most um, limiting resources is going to be both like the storage facilities and the energy requirements, okay? So where in the universe do you go where you have lots of energy and lots of storage capability? The answer is an asymptotic giant branch star. And why do you do that? Well, clearly an asymptotic giant branch star, which is like a thousand times brighter than the sun, has lots of energy. But what you might not realize is that AGB stars are what make dust grains, and dust grains are made of graphite and silicate, and graphite and silicate are what are made, make up computer chips. So an advanced civilization could, in principle, use the silicate and graphite from the, the wind of an AGB star, build a structure, a planetary or solar system-sized structure around the star, much like a Dyson sphere, but not just to eat the energy and to utilize the energy, but to actually synthesize the com computational resources out of the outflow on a planetary scale. Now, you can work out the thermodynamics of this, and you lose about a factor of two in terms of efficiency because you have to satisfy the second law of thermodynamics and whatnot. But you gain about 19 orders of magnitude in energy. In other words, if you build this computing structure, you can beat the limits that I just described by a factor of 10 to the 19. And also, as an interesting thing, you can ask the question, well, if this is a good idea, there could in principle be other civilizations, what would it actually look like? Well, if you look at a color-color magnet, or color-color diagram, um, stars live here, spiral galaxies live here, different kinds of quasars and asymptotic branch stars live here. There's one source, which is this phone number here from the WISE survey, that lives in this area here, which will have the same observational characteristic as a black cloud computer that I just described. So, in principle, not only is this wild idea a complete solution to our computing dilemma, it's, an actual, it's actually observable.